So, I suppose as this um, closing moment of the conference, um, I wanted to bring some of the people back on stage, but I also want to create kind of like a, a moment for discussion with the whole room. Um, so please consider yourself part of this as well. Um, and we have heard from everybody who's sitting here now, except um, Maria Lind. Um, Maria Lind is the director of Tensna Kunsthal, and we have worked together for the discussion that took place um, last December as part of Lunch Bites. And then another face that you haven't seen before is um, Paul Niels. Paul um, has actually is responsible for the performance that you experience uh, throughout the conference. These two um, figures that walked in with the sound of music with them and then engaged in a dialogue that was rather strange. Um, and actually, to launch this, this, this moment, I would like Paul to say a little bit um, about this, about this performance, how it relates um, to what he has been doing with Lunch Bites. It actually reflects on a Lunch Bites discussion uh, on structures and textures. And I think the um, theme that it touches upon connects really nicely to what um, we have heard uh, yesterday and today, especially to David Choslitz's talk. But before we go into that, um, I would like uh, if you could just explain the work a little bit. Okay, should I give like the the broader background? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so it's kind of intentionally complicated, but um, so I guess last I was about this time last year. It was in the spring, maybe. I think it was in the spring. Yeah, there was a there was a talk organized by Melanie and by Lunch Bites at the ICA in London that I. <laughs> Um, participated in along with Wendy Chun and Boris Groys and Ben Vickers, who's here tonight, was moderating. And that was the Structures and Textures um, title that was rehashed here, I, I saw. And um, it was a good talk, and obviously there was a video made, like there's being made right now, and obviously the video was uploaded to the ICA's YouTube channel. Um, which is all kind of default stuff now for how we're processing and archiving and just kind of the flow of activity into distributed content. Um, and I saw this video posted, actually I knew this was gonna happen, which is why I bugged you so much about when it was gonna be uploaded. Um, so YouTube now You've probably all seen this. Um, there's just a little button that you can click below the video and it drops down another window and this window shows you a uh, text of the talk. And it only will do this if it's something that's clearly a discussion. It won't do it for a music video or something like that. And you'd look at this content and you might think, oh, well, it's doing closed captioning for people that have uh, disabilities with, with hearing or something. Um, but actually, uh, the reason that they do this is for search engine optimization because there's, it indexes a shift in server capacity, essentially, that's happened in the past few years where now a two-hour long discussion can be uploaded onto YouTube, whereas only a few years ago it couldn't, and it would have had to exist as a text, which is more easily searchable and turned into keywords. So they basically uh, have an algorithm that turns your discussion into keywords for capitalist advertising because Google makes like something like 97% of its revenue from uh, AdWords, um, which, is, which is remarkable that such a huge company basically is just a very complex advertising agency. Um, so because it was a kind of a heavy art talk like you've been listening to the past two days here, um, the algorithm that they have isn't very good because it's wasted energy to make it too good because the point is to get keywords and not an accurate transcription. So there's like, I don't know, probably 30 or 40% error in the script that it produces. So when you join that together with the dense art talk, it just gets really far out. So 
and it also erases who's speaking in the talk. So I took that script uh, that, that Google had generated out of YouTube, because they own YouTube now, um, and produced a screenplay out of it. And I had friends um, act out this screenplay in my studio, in different spots in my studio in South London, which is in an old public library um, that's going to be demolished and we have from the, the, uh, the local government for not very much money. Um, and this video was shown as a five channel installation um, at Tank TV last October. And that was that work. So when Melanie invited me to do something here at Lunch Bites again, I thought it would be nice to revisit that material and keep it circulating through this um, context, but in a changed state. So I'd never been to the uh, HKV before. So of course I looked it up on Wikipedia, and the first uh, in the first paragraph you get the architect of the building mentioned, which is an American architect named Hugh Stubbins, and I think it's '56 that it's built in, but it's very much in this kind of um, German post-war mode of uh, cultural reconciliation and a lot of kind of generous uh, demonstrations of the openness toward world cultures and that kind of stuff, much in the same spirit as Documenta was started in. Interestingly, um, so that's kind of a side note. But if you and if you click on the architect's name, it takes you to his page, and you realize actually his most famous building is not this building, but a building that he built much later in New York, which was the Citigroup Center. And the Citigroup Center became infamous because it almost collapsed just after it was built, and there was a big cover up. And there's a nice little documentary that's all on YouTube that you can watch about it. Um, but in a nutshell, this building um, had to accommodate a church that was in the corner of its lot. So they engineered a structure that essentially cut off the corners of the building. The building appears to levitate for about the first, what would be eight floors of the building. There's no, um, there's no uh, geographical uh, structure of the building. It's just the support column in the middle and then some on the outside. So it kind of looks like it's floating. And they basically miscalculated um, the interior structure that they replaced this with in relation to hurricane speed winds that do hit New York City every few years. And it was pointed out to them by an engineering student who had been assigned to look at the building by their professor. And anyway, they ended up fixing the building and it didn't fall down, of course, but um, it was in danger of it. And this was kept a secret by the, from the public. And then finally, so it, I guess I went through this process of just kind of like accruing references, like um, through this kind of hyperlink mentality and building up these layers of representation that just went through um, the kind of most direct or most basic phases that they did. And then finally, I was outside the National Gallery in London one day, and I think I had gone there to look at something ancient, like Giotto or something. Um, they've got a lot of really good, um, old paintings there. And I noticed that there's this whole, there's this new style of um, street performer and their gig is that they appear to be levitating. Um, they sit on a platform and that's, the, the platforms are used to support the TV monitors here. And um, it's just essentially begging in a costume. And I think the people that do it are, you know, probably in pretty, um, pretty difficult situations. It's new. It's new in London, but I'm, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a. I'm not a historian of the street performer yeah, style. I'm but I'm oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I was. It's. It's new in Trafalgar Square, but I. I it could easily be an old thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was the first time I noticed it, and um, and I just thought they looked like the building, <laughs> levitating. So I thought that that should be the character that the people that are reading the script are dressed up as. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for this um, elaborate and eloquent explanation of your work. So um, to make a bridge to the keynote that we heard yesterday by you, David, um, you talked about actually two domains. Um, first, 
uh, you ref in reference to the cloud, you mapped out kind of like the infrastructural setting of the inf informational age we live in and how art can function within this. And um, since infrastructure was such a, a, an important aspect of, of, of your talk, um, it immediately made me think of Paul's work. And I was wondering if you could say something about how Paul, or if, like, having heard that, I'm putting you on the spot here, I'm sorry, um, if, if, if that links somehow to some ideas that you um, refer to when, when you talked about the specific layering of information that um, has come uh, to be... Um, has come into being um, in the situation that we are now. What what struck me about Paul's um, account, which is which is fascinating, um, is how the the kind of migration from one image to another, mm. which doesn't necessarily, it's both associative but also. Um, defined by search algorithms. I mean, it's sort of defined by what, it, it's like the search algorithm is your prosthetic. So it's not not you, but it's also. And, and serve it, I, I, I forgot to say that the, the images of the building that are in the video, um, I sourced on fiverr.com. So I got people in New York to go and make 30 second cell phone videos. Uh -huh. So yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that, um, <laughs> Um, what, what I think I was really trying to argue yesterday is that there's been a, and this kind of goes to Melissa's talk a little bit too, I think, there's been a sort of, it seems to me a lack of imagination in thinking about um, patterns of circulation as a kind of plasticity. That's why the term plasticity is old fashioned and perhaps clunky as it is, is sort of important to me. And it's interesting that, I mean, if you think that, you know, you're outsourcing found content, you're using Google, it comes out of a, um, a kind of lived experience. I think if one can imagine the shape of those different registers and how, you know, then you create a body that it's a carnivalesque body, you know, through the performance, and it, I mean, it almost makes me want to think that, you know, that people are transformed into some kind of, you know, Donna Haraway cyborg, but a different kind of one. And I think a lot of post, it's funny, I mean, now I'm just going to spin off to another point, which I noticed, and then I'll shut up for, for now. But the, I was struck that the sort of bio dimension of the post internet which is something maybe, I think it's just as true in Germany as it is in the States, but there's this whole sort of, you know, introduction of live materials that are in the course of transformation. I mean, Josh Klein is sort of involved in that, but other people like Annika Yee, et cetera. And that seems to be part of this sort of post-internet thing too. But maybe not, I don't know, maybe, because I've never quite understood the <laughs> category. But. But maybe you can just briefly explain for those in the audience who are not familiar with that type of work, what you mean by it? Oh, I mean just people who are using chemical, you know, unstable materials um, in their work that are intended to change or degrade or to d d diffuse scent or um, to simulate bodies that are under decay, some kind of natural well, natural is a vexed term, some kind of organic um, hybrid that's both object and organic. I mean, that's why in the life panel I thought that um, I was expecting more of that, you know, the sort of bio power and bio matter in, in entering into the um, art world in some way, or art practice. Is that an observation that you share, Melissa? I mean, I, I struggle, as I said, with this term because if everything is post-internet art, then you kind of have to th think of everything through the 
prism of technology, you know, like are people using organic materials because we feel like everything is so slick and iPhone-like that we want something, you know, cruddy and, and that we can hold on to. You know, I don't know if that's the most useful way to think about, um, you know, think about, you know, the use of these materials. It, you know, they could be determined by, by so many other things. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, you know, I, I'm not sure how to read it. Or I, I'm not sure I want to read it within this prism. Um, does that make sense? So as I'm here as your co-moderator, Melanie, I feel like a co-pilot jumping in if, if uh, you need to go to the bathroom or <laughs> check your iPhone or something. But I'll, I'll throw out a um, couple of thoughts in the middle of this. And it's um, something that you said, Melanie. Um, that there is this fantasy of no referent, which to me sounds very modernist. Isn't that exactly what, what the early avant-garde, particularly the artists who were uh, into abstraction, were doing? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think this idea of modernism as a parallel moment, which was also this, you know, the great modernist break, everything was different. You know, from the 1890s to the 1910s, suddenly, every, you know, the cities existed and they existed with trains and timekeeping materials. And I, I think that kind of, um, you know, I, I think that is still a reference point in terms of, are we going through another shift just like that? You know, and I, you know, again, I don't know if we are. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that modernist, you know, this idea of the formal autonomy, th that's where I think there's a difference from, um, you know, what we're seeing now. This, you know, even if there's no referent, it's still uh, depictive. Yeah, know. which in a way could be read as, as fairly uh, conservative in a way. Mm -hmm. The other reflection is that, um, as far as I could tell, most of the artists whose work you were quoting are NATO artists. They're yeah. coming from NATO countries, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. What about the rest of the world? No, I, I mean, I've, I wonder that a lot, <laughs> because a lot, I've, in all my writing on it, it's always um, been centered, not even just NATO artists, but often just Anglo-Saxon artists, you know, coming from the US and, um, and um, you know, London, actually. And I wonder if this is because, A, I don't know about those practices, which is, uh, you know, a total possibility, or whether this idea of the post-internet hasn't taken hold or, you know, has particularly taken hold in these two centers of power. There is right now um, at Art Dubai, the, you know, they do this content stream alongside the art fair, and they have a whole, um, um, the whole thing is dedicated to art and technology, which is happening kind of alongside this in a parallel universe. And a lot of the artists there are from the region, or, um, and the region, you know, widely conceived, the Middle East, but also India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So I think that's actually a good place to look for, you know, a non-NATO, a different, um, a different framing of it. But that is also um, just like if, if we say that it's Anglo-Saxon and um, Dubai, it's where the commercial art market is perhaps the strongest at the moment. Yeah. So what are the connections there? Well, I, I, not being in Dubai right now, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know their work. I, I'd like to look them up. But I think, yeah, this idea that, you know, the post-internet art work is a very art market friendly work. I think that's true and that's not true. I and mean, this is part of the problem of defining what we're talking about. You know, a lot of the, you know, the Lyon Biennial that was curated by Gunnar Kvaran was seen as one of the kind of first shows in which a lot of these, you know, post-internet art became, you know, a thing and a lot of the pe these people can be seen as a group within it. And, uh, you know, he's someone who is very linked to the market. He has this, you know, kind of um, selling sensibility. And I think, you know, so from the very beginning, you can see this, you know, alignment with um, marketable works. At the same time, I think there are lots of other types of practices that are equally postmodern. I mean, postmodernist, equally post-internet, that are to do with um, um, thinking of new ways of distribution, thinking of new ways of, of identity styling, but those aren't the ones that have been institutionalized. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think that corresponds with. Uh, some of my own observations over the last couple of years, that it, it's uh, similar but also quite different, and it goes on in other places. Mm. No, and I think I think that I mean it's a history that's being written as it as it's happening now. In a way, like we're we're trying to historicize it, 
while it's happening. <laughs> and, it, and I wonder what that is going to do to the history. Is it going to not allow for the process of sifting out you know, the good work from the bad work, or the work that's um, too ratified too early from the work that maybe needs time to, to breathe? So I think that, um, I mean, I don't know if this is a new thing, this, you know, um, this, you know, this amount of writing about it. I'm sure if I were, at, you know, during postmodernism, maybe postmodernism was self-theorizing itself at the same rate. It was. Yeah, so, I don't know, maybe you want to say. I just uh, wanted to, to jump in. You brought up um, the question of the relationship between London specifically and certain approaches to making work. Um, and I won't try and generalize about everybody's work in London. There's lots of London artists that are here today, um, so they probably have something to say about it. But I think it's an interesting question. Also, it's it's kind of counter-modernist, I think, in that asserting the necessity of having some kind of understanding of place in relation to reading a work is obviously um, uh, a a barrier in terms of its universal readability, which I think is the, which is the modernist dictate, um, the most important modernist dictate. Um, and I think in London, I mean, I'd love to hear what other people think, hear from London artists, but um, I think that the capitalist and real estate climate of London is such that um, most artists that I know live in extremely reduced scenarios. You know, in, in London they call it a, a stunning double bedroom if it's the room is big enough that you can open the door all the way and not hit the bed. <laughs> so I think that um, there are certain modes of working that people resort to um, because of the material conditions that they exist in. And I think that all kinds of different um, working methods that involve networks and digital technologies um, are often responses that are available in that material situation, in that relationship between the material situation, which is very clearly political, um, and the work that's put out that's not always directly referencing that political agenda, I think is an interesting one that I don't see discussed many places, partly because I think it's, it interferes with it being universally readable. I, I, just, I still struggle on this idea of, like, that artists are living in a crappy two-bedroom. Like, artists have always, you know, they always are living in crappy two-bedrooms. I, I wonder what, what about the internet makes it different? Like, is it because, like, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm from New York, but I've lived in London for 13 years. Like, I think London has a particular sensibility that, you know, and I, and I think I see, I see it in London works. There are, you know, there's an Englishness about them that you know, defies this internationalization. But I don't know why that should be different, you know, I, I genuinely don't know why that should be different now than, than later. Is it because we're able to see through Facebook or through Skype different, you know, different national characteristics that are kind of more in our face and then we become more aware of one set of national characteristics? Like, you know, it, it's, I think how exactly th these these constants have been changed by the internet has to be examined if we're going to think that the internet has changed everything. Yeah, sorry. I, I just wouldn't see it as, as nationalist at all because I think that London is, you know, directly involved in fashioning itself as a, as a strictly transnational place that is just basically a, a certain corporate function that exists outside of yeah. national specificity. I mean, the national specificity of London in the past, I guess, is the its empire structure, and since they've dried that up now, um, they've got to exploit something else, and it's airports and fractional reserve banking. But I see that as being against national specificity, so I think that maybe London is some kind of petri dish for that. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously there are so many people in London who aren't from London, but I just mean that, like, you know, they're talking about class or they're talking about music bands you've never heard of. Like, I don't know, things like that seem very London to me. Yeah. So, um, returning from London to, um, to digital again, um, I was just wondering um, about the other aspect of your talk, and then maybe we can link to Hito Steyl's work uh, as well. 
You were talking about profiling as the other kind of like lens that is very uh, specific um, um, that has, has come up as a kind of like a specific way to look at these artistic practices that deal with that s this, uh, sp um, this, um, this quality of information that has emerged. So I was wondering, um, having heard the talk as well, that uh, Stefan Dilmut gave and his um, way to frame encryption um, as kind of like a, on one hand side, as a kind of language that has always been there, is kind of like a, a, a code for um, create a niche in a way, but then also um, as something that is needed, how you see your concept of profiling um, link to the concept of encryption as put forward um, um, in Stefan's talk. And maybe, um, uh, Hito, you could say something about this as well, if you feel like it. Um, <laughs> well, my interest in profiles really emerged from um, trying to think about this question of how to describe or how um, large groups of images behave instead of um, single images. Because, you know, in the art world, we tend to want to look at one thing that can be bought and sold. And, and also, you know, the meaning can be extracted from it. So we're, you know, those of us who interpret are also implied in the market, not through, maybe we're not getting huge kickbacks, but we're, we're specifying objects through assigning meanings to them. So I, one of the problems I've been trying to think about is how in an earlier version of the work that I presented, I called a, a mul the multitude of images, which I think is not, because I'm skeptical now of the term multitude to a much greater degree than when I chose to think in those terms around this work, I've dropped it, but also I think that that's maybe not the issue. So for me, a profile is one of the ways that the kind of amorphous um, data reserve becomes manageable. It be, it's a figure of data becoming accessible both for exploitation and for agency. Um, it's one of the most, I mean, a profile is a pattern that's anthropomorphized, right? And so that's why I started in the lecture. I was very interested in this question of the author function because I really do think that the profile is one of the primary figures of organizing vast reserves of information. So that's what's interesting about it to me. And, and I do think that it is also something that artists have exploited. I mean, I'm always in my own work trying to find those um, intersections of a kind of cultural dynamic and um, an aesthetic dynamic and to try to think them not as separate realms but as contiguous or homologous as um, I think maybe Kirsten used that term earlier, someone did. Anyway, I'll stop there. Well, you know, I mean, I'm. Uh, I was asked to participate in this discussion, so I concluded that I would probably have to listen to all the debates, which turned to be out, which turned out to be a huge mistake, because now I have to embody, so to speak, the bio effects of this debate, which means that I'm so utterly confused and bewildered that I can't do much more than almost incorporate, right, the dump object that was subject of some of these debates earlier on. Having said that, there is also little I can add to that specific debate because I'm generally completely disinterested in well, questions of periodization or historicization or art styles or art genres. And to a certain extent, <laughs> one has to say that the art historian 
It's like the natural enemy of the artist, so I'm not going to <laughs> participate in, in an artist. I'm sorry, David, you're so charming, and I have to say, it's so nice. I'm, I'm so pleased you said so nice things about my work. Other people have also done so. I'm not used to it, so really, I very much appreciate that. But, you know, I, it's really not my concern whether... I think in my life I managed to avoid saying the term post-internet art, so this is a first. <laughs> but I couldn't care less no, about whether it's art, whether it's now, whether it's you know, then, and so on. What interests me are questions of violence and infrastructure and media and how this impacts the world and society. And for this reason, I was utterly you know, relieved and grateful for you basically setting the mode of the discussion by mentioning the huge impact that um, Edward Snowden and Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald and you know all their other co collaborators has had over the past years uh, on the intersection of art and media and politics and the mi military and surveillance and so on, using actually quite old-fashioned tools to do so, the tools of documentary art, of you know, first-person filmmaking, actually of DIY filmmaking, Laura Poitras, I mean, she did most of the work, the filming work on her own, the, the tools of old-fashioned journalism, fact-checking, and more than that, uh, the tools of encryption and of responsible data handling, let's put it like this, which also introduces a huge break in data handling practices which just consisted of dumping troughs of material on the internet. And uh, having done so, they also, you know, <laughs> almost as a complete side effect, did away with this stereotype trope of the male genius, tech-obsessed hacker, you know, uh, that is full of his own masculinity and is the only person to manage to pull away such stunts by doing this in a team consisting, you know, of a gay couple and a feminist and a person that was sincerely really courageous. So I think to underestimate the importance of what happened there would be absolutely criminal. I was actually worried that no one would mention that case during this conference. It was far from obvious to me, and I'm quite relieved that many people have, you know, used this as a field of reference. But I think, um, I mean, if I don't know actually what we are talking about, but you know, the the art or the gallery system or the whatever, uh, the art history just totally pales, no, in relevance to what happened um, in in this area, which had. Um, an impact which cannot be underestimated, and it could also be a negative impact, no, in the long run. This we don't really know. Thank you. Um, and now I would really like to give you the chance to ask questions, make comments, anything, really. Um, yeah. Um, oh, I yeah, I, I said that like a little bit too fast because I just thought um, about this quote that's often uh, quoted uh, and I happen to have it right here so I can, um, art was only a substitute for the internet. I just thought of this, um, that Vuk Kusuk said this, you know, this internet artist um, who you mentioned earlier. Um, and this idea, like you just basically articulated that maybe like the whole discussion of art in when we when we have access to like everything via the internet, perhaps other things are more pressing. And um, I was thinking about uh, post internet basically being like a, a one point internet interface where all these artists were discussing together and like it was just about their practices, whatever. And now we're in a two point internet where um, you know we have access to everything alongside each other and everything's kind of like. Uh, in a hierarchical structure rather than a hierarchical structure. I mean, I ideally, or like just information at least flows in that, that kind of way. Um, and maybe, yeah, I don't know, sorry. That was, that was a comment, but um, do you guys have anything to kind of say about, yeah, art versus everything else, something like that? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think one thing that the internet does is that it, it puts things side by side without any distinctions between them, so that you can go from like an image of 
Syria to an you know uh, image of a cat to you know an image of Okado asking you to pay more for your deliveries or what have you. I mean, I think that kind of um, you know the, the lateral move and the lack of any kind of context for things is um, I think it definitely challenges the user in terms of how they appropriately understand the significance of what, exactly what they're looking at. I mean, this is something that you've, I think, in free fall was about that to a certain extent. This, you know, the, the movement of images from context to context, from a real context to a, you know, from the plane being used as a, in the hostage negotiations to the plane being used in speed to the plane being used to make the DVDs that speed was circulated on. So this kind of circulation between, of images between vastly different contexts without any barriers between them, I think is something that, um, you know, both internet technology and art technology avail themselves of, if that's kind of an answer to your kind of question. <laughs> Everybody's probably tired. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, uh, this is a question I actually asked a little bit earlier today, but I felt a little bit frustrated because I didn't think I got the answer I actually really wanted. And I think it's a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it wasn't with the same people or anything, and I, it wasn't that I felt like my uh, question was ignored or anything, but I just, I think it's a good op opportunity, and I think it's relevant, and I just thought it would be okay to ask you guys. Um, but the question uh, I had was uh, concerning, um, it was during the lecture for so society with Stefan and um, uh, uh, Cr Constant, yeah. There we go. Um, Stefan talked about paranoia and how he used paranoia as a way of dealing with uh, or resisting or being aware of like this infrastructure, the surveillance uh, state that we're currently living in with NSA and Snowden and all that. And I, I wanted to ask him that uh, if he thought that there was a, a, a mode or uh, a situation that uh, a person could exist in where uh, is correct to resist, uh, is, a, is a right way to, is maybe a solution of resisting the surveillance state? And I wanted to ask if he thought that, um, and I guess you guys think that, is it naive to think that uh, as individuals or as a collective to be able to control governments and states uh, who have these access to these powers or will we always have to, um, uh, in a way, uh, make it so that we can never use these powers again, you know, with surveillance. Um, uh, is, is, there, is there any hope that uh, we can use an imperfect democratic apparatus to somehow uh, uh, change these laws and uh, make it so that, you know, the government, I, I don't want to get too political, sorry. Um, <laughs> that was one part of the question. The other part was, uh, uh, constant was really uh, interesting for me because. And to whom would you like to direct it to? Um, to, Just. I'm whatever. sorry, I came a little late, um, mm -hmm. so I didn't get the whole, but um, I just, sorry. Uh, Constant uh, talked about uh, balconyism, which I thought was very good uh, counterpoint to what uh, Stefan was talking about, about paranoia, whereas he said, instead of hide, or instead of encrypting or being afraid, which I think is a form of, you know, being oppressed or being uh, scared of the, the, the state, uh, but, uh, balconyism, what Constant talked about was being, you know, free in this ocean of other people, being aware that your existence is being simultaneously uh, duplicated and copied and whatever with, you know, shared with a billion other people. Now the co-pilot has to enter. Can you wrap up? Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I was wondering if, what, uh, do you think that, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, maybe that's good, thank you. Um, and I saw that Hito was grabbing the, t the mic. Yeah, I saw an arm somewhere. There is one with a mic, great. Um, yes, um, 
Well, I can't resist to start with saying that this building actually also nearly collapsed, but then I'll move to my question. Um, and in my question, I wanted to come back to the, um, the alien or anal, an, um, getting <laughs> alien uh, possibility uh, that... <laughs> Uh, but I wanted to move uh, away from, uh, from a political plasticity of, um, of Anton, from uh, Anton in office, Anton in private, to um, actually what could, uh, what could be um, um, more on a, a statical point, and I was wondering how much that could relate to the distancing effect, and here I guess, uh, it also brings the um, several practices that were mentioned today in the um, keynote. So uh, the whole the three D rendered object that seemed so um, artificial, and I was wondering how much that um, can be seen um, in a way that um, uh, Brecht's Fernfreundung's uh, effect uh, or the distancing effect uh, works, and how much um, such an effect can actually. Um, making something weird enough can actually make it understandable, and whether that is um, the reason that those uh, 3D rendered objects became a sort of a language of describing the reality while avoiding to actually capture the reality itself. Should I? Um, for me, the figure the metaphor slash real metaphor of an alien is um, someone who can act outside of, um, you know, normative zones, who can, um, who can articulate assemblages that, that didn't exist before. And so to go back to the earlier question, the one preceding, I think that paranoia is the wrong answer I mean, to me, it's more about generosity and agency. I think that there's too much, you know, like carping and complaining in the art world. I mean, we all know there's too much money sloshing around. So, I mean, the point is to try to do something and, um, you know, stop complaining and do something. That's what I think. Yeah. But uh, if, if I can maybe try to connect the paranoia question with your talk yesterday. So paranoia has been, I mean, I think it's, kind of almost, I don't know, mm, I, I, I don't want to pathologize you no know, political suspicion which is more than often really founded on facts. So that's the first thing. I, I don't, I dislike pathology, but anyhow, uh, paranoia has been described as a failed or incomplete mapping. You cannot manage to comprehend what's going on, so somehow you create a distorted map, a map which has holes or polygons are missing, there is glitches in there and so on. And I think there is a really interesting connection to an aspect in your talk which I found really fascinating, the one of the profile consisting on layered maps, almost like texture maps or custom layers, no? And in these maps, you would have basically several of these glitched custom layers which are in themselves paranoid, so to speak, since they are always missing the whole picture. The totality cannot be expressed. But if you layer them one on top of another, you get some sort of map, right? But the figure of the alien is interesting or fascinating because, as you remember, it's the person in the green morph suit who is able to basically slide between these textured layers, no? And disappear or reappear or to put on some lizard texture or something, wh whatever, no? Um, it's all possible. And is able to navigate, you no, know, the full, the never complete maps, the always incomplete maps created by political suspicion, wrongly labeled as paranoia. Uh, along those lines, I think I think it's also interesting to note that this figure of the alien, which could also be the the illegal alien or the homo sacer or the sans papier, is also like a figure that we all become under global capital because there's things that are happening now that directly disenfranchise everyone from whatever political process they think that they might be involved in, like the, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that's happening right now, um, 
one of the major aspects of which is that it will set up structures whereby multinational corporations can sue state governments for violating things that might actually be statutory law in those countries, but is against the partnership deal, which is done behind closed doors and without any consultation to elected bodies. So it just essentially sets up a structure where um, nation states will never disallow companies from doing things that are actually illegal in those countries. So when we reach that point, I think we all, outside of the highest levels of power, occupy that alien position. So I think that the tactics and strategies that the alien employs to, to sustain itself are, are something that becomes you know, kind of like a kind of like a real politic for, for everybody. I think, um, yeah. Hi, hello. Um, I've got a, a question kind of focused at Melissa, but to, to everyone. I was just thinking about whether the art practices that have been the subject of this conference, whether there is an inherent difference between the, these modes of working, however we understand them, identify them, and other modes of working, which might be deemed uh, traditional or what have you. Um, I, was, I was interested in Hito's little mini outburst saying that she was not interested in all of this. And artists that I work with, that, that is kind of where they come from. They're interested in everything else. Like good artwork tends to be about anything else and it's always been an intuitive process of working, as was quite clear when Paul was describing how he made this new work. And I was just thinking like for artists who have been brought up in this like mass digital age, in the age of internet, who are not working in this kind of identifiable, well, if you call it post-internet, is there an inherent difference between those different modes of working? Or are they all just part of the same thing? Do you mean like, because it's a generationally, it's, it's a category drawn generationally, that everyone has to be post-internet? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the problems with the definition. Like, and I was thinking, you know, about this amnesia and why this amnesia. And I have to say, like, the one thing when I go to a biennial that drives me up the wall is when you go and you see, like, an object that has been moved from the artist's hometown and then it's brought to the, the biennial room and then it's supposed to be significant because it has, like, a mark on it that was made in Cyprus and now it's here, you know, which I think is... You know, you see it again and again. But like that's privileging this memory, this you know, this that this idea that this object has this um, an object has a memory and then it moves. So in a sense, like, you know, it's it's completely circumscribed this this post internet art from from other modes of working for sure. Which is I think one reason people have such problems with the term. I, I think the reason why I think it is important to, I mean, not try, try and, you know, get into a debate, but, like, to, to figure out what we're talking about, because I think there's just so much, um, yeah, it, it just feels like it could be an expansive term, so we get hung up on what we're actually talking about without actually make, making the next step through and thinking, how is the art actually functioning, or, or, or what is it doing, and what is it doing well or badly or differently, or... I, I was really glad uh, during the two days that on several occasions, precisely the question, what does art do? Or what does an artwork do came up? Which I think is, is uh, increasingly important if we are not going to get stuck in uh, some infrastructural um, debates, which are also important, but they've taken over a lot. Um, so I was hoping that maybe towards the end now we can also uh, think a bit more about what is at stake uh, from the different perspectives. You s mentioned it a little bit, what you think now is uh, important to do right now. Um, get going, do the important thing, but maybe we should actually uh, see if we can do a round of that in the midst of this plethora of many different um, issues that have come up. So shall I start? Yeah. I think my conclusion um, from my perspective, having set up this series, what is next or what we can do now is, I think throughout this conference it has become clear that the digital has become that which is just among us and it has become an extensive infrastructure that is composed 
of many different problematic fields. So digital art or like the framework that I initially set up thinking about art and digital culture, I, over the years of its existence, I um, struggled more and more with this art and digital culture because what is digital culture when um, the term digital culture actually points to culture as such that we live in. I mean, of course, I'm only talking about our culture here. So um, I think if we move on, we should actually, I'm kind of happy that this series comes to a conclusion because I think the framework, I mean, not that I want to, uh, no, no disrespect, I thought it was excellent and I'm really happy about this conference, about this series, and I'm really happy that we could invite so many excellent speakers and that we saw performances and artworks that I think are most exciting. But um, I do think that um, the digital as a category within an art framework makes less and less sense. Hito, what about you? Conclusion. Well, what's at <laughs> stake? Uh, you indicated a few things. Maybe you want to elaborate a little bit? Maybe I want to shorten down. I think I... I I, I, I noted three things which I don't understand, but I think they are the conclusion. The first thing is the sentence that the present is empty, seems to be empty, because, I don't know, the, some people are looking towards the new and the rest towards the past, but there is nothing, <laughs> nothing in the present. Maybe this is the effect of this shock wave still. No, we seem to be like past an explosion where something happened and the impact is not yet felt, but there is some sort of vortex or it's like a calm, like in the eye of the hurricane. So the present is empty. The second is we noted, many people noted that infrastructure is violent, but I came to think that probably it's more interesting to think that violence is the infrastructure of the internet, no? Whenever an act of violence happens, it acts like the fuel, like the catalyzer, like the, you know, affective primordial energy that cr actually creates the, the infrastructure, not only of the internet, but, um, you know, this, this whole um, überbau. Oh, oh. Superstructure. Uh, superstructure of communication, which we witnessed today. And the third, Again, going back to this idea of profile, which I continue to circle in my head, um, what to do about it. There was another shard of something, uh, a conversation today, where some Ben Vickers mentioned the idea of black transparency. And that really caught my attention. How in the age of permanent profiling, no? how to create this area of black transparency of something which is at the same time totally transparent and opaque. I'm thinking about this because <laughs> I'm actually in a post-production furor and my <laughs> colleague and collaborator Max has finally managed to blow up the Venice German pavilion in Cinema 4D. <laughs> so actually I'm whole day was in a shard of flying glass objects, you know, circulating around me in zero gravity, these fascist ruins, you know, like in the interstellar version. And <laughs> I was trying to reconfigure them again into a piece of infrastructure using some cheesy after effects shatter thing. And I was always trying to uh, almost desperately yank up something that's called forced opacity, forced opacity. You can make objects transparent if you use it. But if you do so, you reduce the reflection. So you can make glass transparent, but then it won't reflect and it doesn't look like glass. It's very, very paradoxical, no? And I thought that one can apply it to many things that were said about criticality today. How, in an age of complete transparency, how can you still have any reflection on anything? Because there's no more reflection. The surface doesn't reflect anymore. You cannot basically critically reflect onto anything because this surface is too transparent. And in this case, I think you need something like black transparency, right? 
in order to enable still some sort of reflection. I'm not even going to insist on criticality in that reflection on this transparent surface. Black Transparency happens to be the title of an upcoming book by uh, the Amsterdam-based design duo Metahaven. David? Um, I think that art has um, a lot of power that people like to disavow, and instead there's the notion that um, one should exit the realm of art and um, try to appropriate other kinds of power. So I think, I think it's important to understand where, where we are um, and to try to understand how one can use um, the force that's already here um, to make knowledge. Because to me, I mean, art is a form of knowledge and that is a valuable thing to do. I mean, you know, I just think it's a good idea to produce knowledge. And um, artists do it in a way that other kinds of disciplines can't and won't. And um, they do it with a time scale that isn't the scale of now, actually, I think. I mean, really, I think what distinguishes art is that it's always wanting to be forever, no matter, I mean, people rarely will admit it, but, you know, that's the idea, that it's going to last beyond tomorrow, beyond tomorrow's political engagement. And, um, you know, that's a very difficult but a very significant thing to do, I think. Such a big question after such a long day. Um, I'm mostly thinking I want to drink. But, um, I mean, I think, I, think it's a, I think it's an exciting moment in many ways. Um, and you know, if we're in the eye of the storm or we're in the storm, I'm not sure. I think the exciting moment isn't dated to the internet or to the iPhone. I think the exciting moment is also the moment that um, we brought politics into the realm of art, you know, this kind of Ranciere's twinning of art and aste um, aesthetics and politics. I mean, I think that is still something that's sending shockwaves through discursive events like this and this, you know, um, bringing of discursivity into the, the realm of the art object, the art world. So I think that that for me is um, is a really interesting development that maybe is going parallel to to digital technologies or the effects of digital technologies. I think it'd be good to try and um, maybe once the storm has passed, see how all these things were happening and and happened in parallel, perhaps not even um, as uh, influenced by each other as we think they are. But mostly, I want. <laughs> Um, yeah, wow. Well, um, well I, th I think just um, at, a, at a basic level, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about particular terms, and I think now is a good time to not be too hung up on retrofitting pre-existing terms with contemporary episodes that we're experiencing and want to have some kind of discussion about, um, which is why I think of the scenario as something more like post-art internet. Um, if we think of art as a quite bracketed historical period that has a discursive and social apparatus around it, um, and whether or not it's, it's a clean break or a dirty breakup, or if some people think the relationship's still happening, I mean, that's, that could be. Um, but I think it's it's a good moment to to create new terms and to also yeah try and describe things that are happening rather than to always be retrofitting new events onto previous descriptions. That that would be a fascinating outcome, right? If that whole discussion was concluded on the question whether this is post art or after art, as the title of one of your books, David, rather than post-internet, right? We tend to think it's forever. That contemporary art will last forever. Maybe it was over. Yeah, I mean, in internet is yeah. a much more ambiguous, uh, undefined term than art is. I mean, art is, is so, such a cumbersome word. Um, that's not to dismiss everything that's called as art. It's just to, in going forward with discourse, 
internet is a much vaguer term because, it, of course, it now also refers to internet of things, internet of emotions, internet of uh, everything. So I, I don't think it's just the browser window that we're talking about. It's this. It's a it's a change in mentality, and I think that that's something that's very interesting now is the way that a lot of these infrastructural level things have created mental shifts and those mental shifts are being indexed by things that people are producing. And that, I mean, that broader aspect of technology that kind of like, that it ex extends to all different realms, um, that was the thing that I was referring to earlier. And with that, I think we should um, wrap it up because it's been a long day and we all feel it, I feel. <laughs> Um, but I would like to thank everybody for um, having attended this conference. I would like to thank the Goethe Institute again and all of the partners of the project and especially the HKW for hosting us. And of course, most of all, the panelists and speakers. Thank you so much.